Minister Umerov, welcome to the program. Can you confirm that the head of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, Viktor Sokolov, is in fact dead or alive? Well, first of all, he is in our temporary occupied territory, so he is not, he should not be there at all. So if he is dead, uh, it's a good news for everybody that we are continuing to deoccupy our territory. Do you think you will get the, uh, are they called Actums, uh, those long range missiles from the United States? Uh, we have, uh, we have just had a successful visit to United States, so Hopefully, uh, soon we will see the results. <laughs> I'm trying to understand from you yeah. whether Ukraine is entering a new phase of not just depending on your friends for weapons and ammunition, but are you planning, as I've read, a big, you know, build-up of your own in terms of manufacturing, of ammunition, weapon systems and the like? Uh, I'll just to explain you the logic behind. As Russia always alleges us as a failed state and always alleges us uh, in corruption, uh, we want to say to our partners that we are very transparent and we're going to make the procurement, contract management, logistics very transparent. And uh, we're going to uh, supply all these weapons uh, imported to our countries by either uh, by buying them directly or through the foreign military aid, but we're also going to localize all the production. Uh, don't want to go to details, but uh, this is a supply chain management risk assessment that we need to localize as much as we can so that uh, we'll have sufficient facilities to, uh, to have the weapons we need uh, for the occupation of our territories. You said once that everything, you know, that can be produced locally must be produced locally? Uh, I, uh, my focus is that, of course, the Minister of Defense should be supplying its defense forces with whatever they need uh, to regain territory and to defend their people. But uh, at the same time, I have uh, focused to what President Zelensky have uh, said, that we need to uh, have the local production so that uh, we could have more uh, workforce and they would be focused on to the defense technologies and uh, after we win the war we would be one of the uh, largest uh, uh, defense tech uh, countries so at this stage my priority is to localize everything that what could be localized to have a local production on anything that our forces need can I ask you a little bit about strategy? A lot has been reported about your own, uh, you know, your own origins. You are Tatar from Crimea. This is your homeland. And as you know, and as we've reported, quite a lot of Ukrainian effort has gone into, uh, you know, striking and targeting Russian facilities in occupied Crimea, uh, annex Crimea. How important is that for you personally and for the counteroffensive, I'm Ukrainian of Crimean Tatar origin, uh, and of course, as a person who was uh, uh, born in exile, in deportation, and have uh, felt the hardship myself, uh, being a refugee or internally displaced person, uh, of course, I, I feel heartbroken that uh, for almost ten years I'm away from my homeland. So, uh, and we have many people that are now uh, living as internally displaced persons from the occupied territory. So it is a personal, uh, of course, uh, focus for me to deoccupy all the territory so uh, that our IDPs become a, uh, not IDPs, but a normal citizens so that we can live our own life. So as a Minister of Defense, of course, I'm focused to our strategy of victory. Uh, I'm focused to supplying coal, whatever uh, needed to our soldiers, but at the same time, I will uh, be feeling happy if I'll go back home. Mm. Now, corruption. There has been a lot of focus on that, and we have noticed that uh, several of the deputies uh, have been dismissed. Six out of seven deputy defense ministers have been dismissed. Is that about allegations of corruption? You have said the whole defense ministry needs to be rebooted. 
What do you mean? So firstly, we continue our efforts for being very transparent. So we make uh, the very clear assessment on acquisition and sustainment. We're putting uh, the system, a uh, very transparent procurement system, a very transparent uh, contract management system, and uh, we'll be uh, uh, probably consolidating and unifying all the Defense Forces logistics systems. So at this stage, uh, rebooting needed for the new challenges that needs uh, to come. The previous team worked when there was full-scale invasion and there was no system. Uh, many partners, many uh, people uh, have abandoned, but then they regained the confidence. So uh, at this stage, we need to bring the country to victory. So there needs to be a new uh, set of, uh, let's say, uh, targets that uh, strategically we need to uh, get to, and I'm here to make it happen. Let me ask you about weapons that you have been given and weapon systems. So it was announced on Monday that the first of the uh, Abrams tanks have arrived, the M1 Abrams tanks have arrived. Now, I remember interviewing your predecessor, Minister Reznikov, in January when it was announced that they would be coming. That's practically 10 months ago for all intents and purposes. That's a long time to wait for, for weapon systems in your current environment. I mean, do you think that you're getting what you need when you need it? Well, there is always uh, questions, but uh, our focus is uh, a victory. And uh, at this stage, we need uh, more weapons that, to make the game change. So at this stage, when HIMARS arrived, we made a progress. Uh, uh, when tanks came, uh, we made a progress. And soon, hopefully, the jets will come and we will make progress. That's why uh, this war, uh, this strategy of victory needs to be put as a priority. And we need these weapons to uh, regain the territories and have advantage on the battlefield. Let me put to you what a former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, told me about um, essentially the game plan. Uh, you traveled to meet uh, the international partners, as you said, uh, at Ramstein. You went with President Zelensky to the U.N. This is what Kurt Volker told me during that time. Take a listen. Turning it to the U.S. side, I think there is a growing sense that we don't see an end in sight. And you hear that from members of Congress. How much is this going to cost? How long is it going to go on? So there's a frustration there. Can you hear the frustration from the American side? What is the game plan? What is the end game? Uh, and how long is this going to go on? End game is that when we reach our internationally recognized uh, borders, uh, we bring Russia to justice and uh, regain our old territories. So the focus should be the winning Russia on our grounds and uh, to make them accountable for all the damages and atrocities uh, they've done. So we need to understand that the people should be helping Ukraine because it's for the national security uh, reasons of their own countries because Russia will not stop. It will go and go and go. It has been all the centuries for the last 300 years. It was expansion, it was brutality, it was killings. So Ukraine is defending the values that people share, the independence, the sovereignty, the human rights. So we want our people to be happy and be a part of European Union and NATO. Uh, so that's why we defend our own values. President Zelensky have uh, given uh, the world class, I would say, the uh, example of resistance. And it, go, it gives uh, big hope uh, to people, uh, an example of courage, an example of retaliation and resistance. So uh, these, uh, these values are shared by uh, most of our peoples and um, uh, with most of our partners. So uh, this war should end only with one conditions when we regain all of our territories and we regain and free people. Why? Because, as I said, uh, Russia should be uh, taken accountable for what uh, it caused to the world order. And uh, that's 
that's probably the answer uh, when it will finish. But uh, our focus and priority is to finish this war uh, as soon as possible with victory uh, and uh, make them accountable for what they did.